Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Uncut and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they premiere and there's also a PayPal, Patreon and crypto link in the info box below the video. Also below this video you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy. Speaking of Patreons, I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon. So a massive shout out of thanks and appreciation to Austin Witsit, John Kays, DL Hill, Julian Jeremiah, Max E. Tyken, Michael Kahn, Patrick Gunnels, Banter, Will Brax, Mel B. Styles, Troy Shuka, Bose Nail, Sampson, Maris, Harry Blade, Mobile Max 777, Neo the One, Lost Cat FE, Rob W, Open Minded, Reese Pound, Del West Watson, Mike, Muted, Dick Earth Skeptic, Maria Neelands, Unbelievable Productions, Blue Ridge Ranger, Rob H, The Real Gabster, Wind Rider, Liam Nedrick Jr., Abraham Mohammed, Nyby, Adrian Quintana, Skeptic Line 936, Life is Short, Fireball X, The Flat Earth Channel.com, Texas Mike, Edwin Johnson, and David Wayne Foster. So, another massive thank you to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. Now, I will hand over to whoever is in Discord and G, so you can enjoy their conversation while I set up for today's live show. My check. Hello. Hi. Sorry, I'm in the other <laughs> room with the bad mic for another week, I think. How's it coming through? Seems right to me. Good. Hey, Neil, can you hear us? Neil? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. So look, you pull this out, right? If you want to go the other way, you go like this, see? This goes all the way the other way, too. See? See? And it goes all Oh, it don't? Oh, okay. So it Shot goes one dark. way, all right. Shot dark, Neil. Uh, we're going to leave, if you can leave it all right here. <laughs> don't even bring it in rooms. Just leave it right along the wall. Yeah, drop it right there is good. Do we need that gotcha. much? How many rooms are on each floor? <laughs> to be honest with you, I don't know. I've only been here a couple of days. Um, and I, I'm not even doing the rooms. I'm doing fucking... Um, You're doing coffee, right? Yeah, uh, this guy knows. Huh? This guy knows. How many rooms are on each... Uh, on each... Uh, okay, so leave that here and whatever we need. Yeah, whatever we need or whatever we have left, we'll bring to the next, to the next floor or we'll, we'll call you for This the is floor. entertaining. Yeah, very. Sorry, guys. That's all right, Neil. Sorry. <laughs> very amusing. A, this, job is, this job is a disaster. I mean, it's, it's a, the Hard Rock Cafe. It's above it, and it's, I guess it's like a hotel. I mean, these rooms are a disaster. They're so okay. freaking small, and so much stuff is in here. Anyway, sorry. No, it's all right. For you to start, I, I was waiting for you to start speaking Dutch like Arwen. That's <laughs> no, all good. Don't worry about it. By the way, Nathan, I, I listened to that ball busters again before the show started, how you um, summarized everything and explained sci the scientific method. I mean, it was so on point. You mean in the live really show? It really opens up an understanding. You mean at the beginning of the live show? Yes, the ball busters. Right before QE said, he took over to do his um, presentation. You summed it all up, and it was just very, very, very good. Okay, I can't remember very, what I said. Very easy to understand. I just used it as a segue to get us from the, um, what do you call it, introduction chit chat to the presentation. So I, whatever came to mind at the time to segue between the two. If that was good, then great. <laughs> 
Yeah, and Brian's right too. I mean, how to hijack science, the, the word hypothesis. I told you, I hear all the time, you ask anybody, I could ask anybody on this job site, what does hypothesis mean? Just say educated guess based, by, based on fact. <laughs> yeah, they replace what is a, an actual hypothesis in the context of natural world with a just so story. So they mistake the hypothesis for an explanation. So the presupposition, the guess, becomes the explanation. Yeah, well, the supposition becomes a presupposition. Instead of if A, then B, it just becomes A, therefore B. Yeah, that's the, that's the hoodwink. Yep. Well, it'd be nice if there was some kind of measurement for any of the nonsense that they've said. Hey, John. Good to have you back. John, that's my new weapon. I got my little where's the radius shank, and I'm using it everywhere. Cut through all the nonsense. Excuse me. You need a radius for that. Don't got one? Sorry. Well, you, if you live on a sphere, you have to be able to measure a radius. That's just simple. You know, if you don't measure curvature, then you don't live on a sphere. Yeah, it still gets me, it still surprises me that people are shocked and shaken when we're insistent on getting a radius value before they assume it. Now it's been debunked. Yeah, it's measured flat. Um, that's the, uh, and then 10th Man showed how you use those measurements of a flat plane and you know it seems like the sky is flat too yeah the whole celestial sphere is imagined imaginary because of the way your eyes work obviously when you see the clouds at the distance seemingly touching the tops of the ocean water that's perspective the vanishing point and all that that goes with it obviously if it's ten thousand feet above you in uh, altitude, the clouds that are directly above you, and as you look out to the horizon, they seem to be coming to touch the water. But are they? No, they're probably 10,000 or even more feet above that, depending on the temperature and what's happening over there. So the stars, same thing. You look in the sky, as you look to the horizon, they call that your, your local dome, celestial dome, but it's really your eyes showing that last star is that last cloud touching the ocean. But it's not. Made a few more adjustments to the sound today. Hopefully it improves. It was just a little bit quiet after adjusting everything. This was uh, based on what show that you figured this one at? Just the last last week of shows, basically. Oh, I see. Hey, I saw um, Mitchell from Australia is going to be approaching the argument from the sextant, it looks like. He had a little promo. Well, it's, it's part of his Flat Earth School logo, so I would hope so. Oh, I'm excited. I can't wait. I, I, I hope everybody jumps on this. All the flat earthers just start researching the sex and how it works and just deluge the ballers. It does take some understanding. I mean, you have it's not as simple as just read a paragraph and understand how it works to the point where you can demolish the sphere. You know, you've got to understand how um, the area of equal altitude works, how to actually do triangulation, basically. You know, you can't just say, is a paragraph go away and demolish Globus. Yeah, but it's a lot easier than they think. The The trap that I didn't want to fall into uh, and haven't even addressed, because that's not my point with the sextant, is the minutia of the actual calculations. Uh, it is so many steps that 
That's why the navigator just trusts the book and the method. They don't even know what they're doing half the time. They're just following them, you know, okay, after this, I got to do this. After this, I got to do that. Okay, I got to count for this. Okay, and there we are. That's where exactly I am. All right. And then you go find some guy who does the sex and without all that. He says, yeah, if I want to be more precise, I go through the minutia. But, you know, when you're in the open ocean and you do it this way, it's quicker. And if I'm near it, I might be off by 20 miles. But, you know, you're going to see the darn thing in 20 miles. So what's the point of going through all that work? So it's just to get it exact, all this, you know, minutia steps. I'm avoiding all that. Because the purpose is, how'd you get your angle? So all you got to understand, if you want to uh, use the sextant and how it works to destroy the heliocentric model of the ball, is to say, how do you achieve an angle? You need two straight lines meeting in a corner, creating a vertex. And it destroys it right there. So it, it can be easier, but the, the trick is not to fall for Oh, okay, I want to know exactly how everything works. No, no, you don't need to go that far. We know it works, but how does it work? It uses angles and a horizontal coordinate system. It's a horizontal coordinate system. I, it's great to hear the, uh, the anti-flat earthers, though. When they come in, they try to argue against it without uh, talking about the horizon or the bottom of the triangle. It's good stuff. Oh, yeah. That's the best part. And I like the way Nathan just <laughs> slaps him around with that. I mean, everything at the horizon is at zero. And directly above you is 90, your zenith. That's how sex and works. Your 90 is your zenith. And just like a protractor, the horizon is zero. Now, somewhere in between that, is the zenith of the star that you're shooting. And it's got a geographical position over the Earth. And they know where that is because it's in the book. And then you use the angle and you figure out for each degree, it's 60 nautical miles. So if it's a 50 degree angle that you shoot uh, from your position, and you're on the 90, right? Because directly above you is your zenith, there's your 90, and then you gotta use the horizon zero, so you're, you're right there. You shoot a star at 50, you say, all right, what's 50 minus 90? 40, what's 40 times? 60, because each degree is a nautical mile. Okay, you got 2,400 miles. You're 2,400 miles away from the GP address of that sun at its zenith, at its 90. That's how it works. You can't get an angle with a curved line, so it's over. Anyone in Discord want to discuss angles? Then there's only a couple of people in there. Yeah, no, but I've been explaining say. to my I explained to my wife that drop day. She got it. I explained it to uh, a carpenter. He got it right away. He says you can't get an angle <laughs> like this. He says, what idiot doesn't see this? That's what he said. He got right away. Yeah, I don't think it's so advanced that most people can't comprehend it with a brief explanation of it. Does anybody know how well, Brian did with uh, Wolfie? I'm afraid not, sorry. No. I'm sure we'll find out. You said, the, back to what you said, Nathan. It, it's advanced if you go into the calculation, your, your, your little paperwork that you got to do with all the different things. 
but that's not the argument. The argument is how, how do you achieve an angle? If you keep it on that, they got nowhere to go. No obfuscation, no burying it under some other, you know, well, after that, we have to do this and do, no, no, you got to get the angle first. So how'd you get the angle? Well, before the black swan, I would claim a tangent to uh, the horizon and use the dip angle to get my angle. Yeah, but the dip dip angle uh, in the section is just assuming you actually took it with your eyeballs on the water to achieve zero. The dip angle in the section is to achieve zero. So how could, how could they say it falls away after the horizon and not uh, figure out some kind of workaround for that? If they got to figure out a workaround for their, them being nine feet above the sailboat just to get zero to be zero, how does after the horizon, the earth start curving away? How do they account for that drop? How do they fix that? Well, they can't. Uh, let, let me draw something up and I can show you. But I need a tangent. A straight, I a straight line? Yeah, you need a straight line to the horizon. So That's a constant position. Yeah, so basically a zero line or 180, which is a straight line, both work. Well, it, see, the the horizon wouldn't actually be the, the 90. Um, it would be slightly off, but you still need a straight line to it. How about the st stars GP 3,000 miles away? What would that need to be? Well, that'd probably get lost in obfuscation after you established that the horizon's <laughs> a tangent. Yeah, well, if the it needs to be a tangent all the way to the GP, and then the curve could start. How's that? Yeah, that, therein lies the problem. The star can be beyond the horizon. So if you're going to say, okay, we've got a tangent to the horizon, we're going to assume that's straight. It's like, okay, but that in your sphere model is the the edge of the sphere, the leading edge that's going to be blocking things. And it's going to be a, a squared function beyond that and to that, to be fair, um, of drop. Well, where you're measuring your 90 degree to the star is potentially drastically in advance or beyond that horizon point. And it could be hundreds, if not thousands of miles to get a massive circle of equal altitude. So you can't have that drop beyond the horizon which is necessitated by a sphere. It just doesn't work. That's the bottom line. Well, that's why they say uh, you can't have, that's why they don't use a globe to do their chart work on because it's too big of a circle. They're already telling you the GP is like 3,000 miles away or 4,000 miles away. They, they already know it's a massive circle. So what they do is they bring it down to where your lines of position, which is also used as circle of equal altitude, but if you think of it as a position line, they're taking a part of that arc of that circle and they're narrowing it down to your dead reckoning position where you thought you were when you took the siding. And you're pretty close to it because of the day before navigation information that you have in your log. So when you break that circle down to a small area, of course, the arc doesn't look like an arc. It looks like a position line, a straight line. So that's where they go in and they reduce that circle to through the uh, the bearing of the azimuth of the star, right? They already know the degrees, how, how far away it is. They just draw a line. They do their little calculation there on a chart, a small map, a flat map right there where the navigator's desk is. And they're treated as straight lines to get the fix. Because, you know, a big circle like that, when you narrow it down, you never see the arc. It, it looks like a straight line. So we could treat it like a straight line. This is, that's all they're doing. They're never doing a big circle. They, they know that's how, what it is, but they have to reduce that down to the map to where they can, you know, start making their straight lines to find the fix using the altitude of the star and the azimuth for the bearing. Well, have you dealt with uh, the rebuttal of nuh-uh yet? Well, 
not uh, to an angle when you can't say it, nah to an angle. Well, they're just going to look stupid again because they're going to going to say nah straight is curved, and we laughed at them and still are laughing at them because they can't call a curve a curve because they ain't got one. Which so they got to say straight is curved. Which bit were you saying nah to, as in it's just a general nah to everything? <laughs> right, right. That's that's what I've been running into. Is the nah. <laughs> Well, if someone said not nah, to me right now from Discord or anywhere, I'd say, please uh, read me the definition of an angle. You around, Neil? You hear us? Did you? Th Probably doing something. Did either of you two listen back to Ballbusters? I, I can hear you. What do you think is the sound on Ballbusters? What was that? Yeah, you didn't care. I said, what did you think of the sound, given that I spent a significant amount of time with Quantum Eraser going over the sound settings to make it improved? Oh no, the sound was fine. I didn't hear any hissing or anything. Everything, everybody sounded clear. Exactly, everyone sounded clear. But if you go back to a previous show and compare, everyone's overloaded, distorting. It, it sounds nasty. Good morning. I'll have to, I'll have to check it out and uh, give you proper props when I hear the difference. But I'm sure you did fine. It's that like fine. Well, it's got this, it suffers the same problem as mine. It's a bit too quiet. But I didn't want that to be, I didn't want it to clip before knowing all of the compressors sound nice and aren't too drastic or cutting off too quickly or coming in too quickly, etc, etc. So you want to hear all that without any issue whatsoever and then turn it up to the point that it's not going to distort. So I just wanted to do at least one show where I could monitor it back and go, yeah, this sounds good. None of the guests sound horrible. Nothing's distorting, nothing's clipping, other than people clipping their mics which you can't do anything about, literally nothing you can do about somebody getting too close to their mic and overloading it. You can't you can't solve that, but you can solve them being too loud or not being close enough in level, all of that stuff you can solve. I think you might, have, you might be onto something because I was arguing with somebody in chat yesterday. They were saying that, uh, oh, I said silence is deafening when um, Osho was dead silent. I forgot on what point. And some moron in tax goes, uh, being muted is not silence. So they think you're, you're muting them. I said, trust me, he's not being muted. The guy's like, well, I can hear the clicking, so I know he's being muted. Whatever. I normally overtly state it, which is at the point where I'm kicking them out. I don't just mute them, I server deafen them so they can't say anything and they can't hear anything. And at that point, they're essentially excluded from the conversation. Yeah, that's that's obvious because uh, you open it up and they're still talking while you're talking. You close it, see, they're talking while I'm talking. And then you talk without them being able to be heard by us. And then you say, here, let's see if they're still talking. You open it up, they're still talking. <laughs> so it's like, well, what's the point? They know what they're doing. They're just playing around. Uh, I see Nathan using some interrogation tactics on some people. Like he'll he'll actually like mind trick them into silence. That's my current fad, if I'm honest. So <laughs> watching, um, I've recommended them a few times, but the behavioral panel or the behavior panel. I'm sure I've stuck a few links to them in the war room a couple of times. Yeah, you've mentioned them, but again. You're dealing with a, psych, a psychological situation with these people who are here for one purpose, and that's to cause chaos. We're dealing with jerk offs. Not about jerk -offs. They're still just people, though. Well, some of the characteristics seem to parallel with what is described by one of the behavioral panel experts as resistance to interrogation training 
and indeed, as you've already identified, interrogation training. So when they go over some of the techniques that are used in police interrogations and they highlight some of them, you go, oh, right. OK, I experience that on a daily basis from my opponent. Now I know what it is. Right, I'm going to have to push a few buttons. Yeah, take your time. Push the right ones. Hey, Brian. Hey, thank you, Nathan. Hey, Neil. Uh, who else is here? Uh, John. John, hey, John. Sorry, I, I'm going to be on mute for a while, but I'll be just listening in, but I'll come back in maybe half two or quarter to three, okay? I'll be driving okay. in, in their place. So I, I'll you, talk to you. Did Sorry? you have your debate? No, no, not yet. No, it's coming up uh, probably the end of the week or something like that. Towards the Friday, I hope. Yeah. So, All right. Uh, I'll have a chat with you before that. We got you. Talk to you in a while, okay? All right. Bye. So, there you go, Neil. It hasn't happened yet. A lot of the tactics I've seen so far is just trying to get you to doubt your position. You got cut off there, John. Yeah, I thought my phone got disconnected. No, it's me. I'm in the mountains. But we didn't get to hear the end of your statement. Uh, obfuscation tactics. Oh yeah, they're they're trying to get you to doubt your position without actually considering their own most of the time. Like <laughs> they know it's a ball; they don't need to think about it. Yeah, they got a some kind of mental block when it comes to that that they uh, put there on purpose. I imagine it'd be like trying to tell a stranger uh, kid that Santa doesn't exist, you know? It'd be the same, you get the same reactions from him. Yeah, but I had all these presents all these years. It has to be Santa. Chimneys are real, therefore there has to be a Santa. I see no flaw in that logic. logic. You what now? Log what? I said I see no flaw with that logic. Uh, that non sequitur? Yeah, of course. Happy belated birthday, Nathan. Oh, thank you very much. Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Live. I'm your host, Nathan Oakley, and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live, and there's also a PayPal, Patreon and Crypto link in the info box below the video. Also, below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy. 
Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you are currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcome back on the next stream. Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel. So please share the show on Facebook and Twitter. Now we are joined by 10th man, Neil, father of a stolen child, also known as Refracted Curvature, Brian's Logic, and a whole bunch of people in Discord. So welcome, one and all. Good morning, good morning. Hey, good morning. Hey, hey. Before the live show got started, people were asking how you got on over the weekend, Brian. So I assume you debated Wolfie? He said uh, while you were gone that he'll join us later in the show. He's driving the car right now. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, we will. We'll ask him about it later. Oh, but, we... but he didn't debate Wolfie. He said he... it's next week. It's... Oh, it's not happened yet. Oh, okay. Well, that answers that question then. Oh, well, we've got nothing to discuss in that regard then. Let's do a bit of housekeeping. Any evidence of a physical geometric sphere edge horizon formerly known as Earth curvature? I'll let John answer that. No. -uh. I think I think you'll need half of that is what he was hoping you would say. Hello. Hey Arwin. Good afternoon. A bit quiet. Maybe we get a bit close to your mic. Good afternoon. Hello, nice to have you. If you can let me know in the uh, uh, live stream chat how the sound is, that'd be brilliant. I've been fiddling for the last day or so over the weekend making a few tests, so if you could just say sounds good or sounds terrible, that'd be really handy. Thank you very much. So Earth Curve, we'll try that again. Let's rewind time. <laughs> Any evidence of a physical geometric sphere edge horizon formerly known as Earth Curve, John? Negative. I am not John. You'd need half of that, are. wouldn't you? Ah, oh, it was rumpus. <laughs> Try again, Rams. You'd need half of that, wouldn't you? You would. You would need half of that. That's correct. Any evidence of axial rotation of the Earth-based variety? You'd need half of that axis. too, wouldn't you? Oh, just too many people. Too many answers. <laughs> <laughs> it's all coming too quickly. Wait, I think I may have a a solution. Oh, oops. A solution to what problem now? Ah. Now to the. Nah, it's not really a solution. Continue on. Oh well, thank you. Any evidence of the distance to the sun? I think you might need R for that. Yeah, you would, yeah. Any... Right, so... Go on, go on, Alvin. I think I'm finding a, a pattern is being revealed. Please continue. You got the R zombies. Excellent. Any scientific evidence of gravity? I think you need R for that. <laughs> You do. Uh, any evidence of a self-perpetuating molten iron core at the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth? R? You are. You are going to need R for that. Yes, that's correct. Correct, Mundo Mombra. Okay, all right. All right. What makes you think there's a pattern here? R. Oh my God! We have turned into the R zombies. <laughs> we just keep saying R now. <laughs> Well, no, I'm going to break that pattern right now. Any single viable hypothesis from any of the fields of astronomy, cosmology, or astrophysics? R. When they, when they start talking, uh, yeah, they're, going to, they're going to need R for that. Yeah, well, I missed the beginning. I just heard. Based on R. I just I need some concise answers. If you're going to have weasel words in there, I need to hear them all. When they start talking to oh, explain the their observation. Let's try it one more time. 
Hold on, Rams. <laughs> uh, yes, in this field, uh, when they start talking to explain their observations, you're going to need R for that. Okay, there's a good chance they'll need R for that. Fair enough. Rams, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. R is the hypothesis. What? Yeah, R is not a hypothesis. I thought there was more to come. But maybe the anti-flat Earth yeah. would say such a thing, potentially. Maybe just... Why don't they just declare R to be a law, you know? <laughs> they pretty it's much do, are we? to everything they do, so... Yeah, it is their unwritten law. The law of begging the question of R is an unwritten rule of the fundamentalist religious sphere belief, but they do it unwittingly. And it's a conscious decision on the part of the anti-flat earthers. Any evidence you can have gas pressure without the necessary antecedent of a container to press upon? Atmosphere, you're going to need R for that. That wasn't the question, though. R, it's hard to drop the Plus, habit, isn't it? Uh, it's a sphere-shaped gas. Is not R necessary for that? That's... Yeah, but he didn't say that, though. Yeah, I'm asking for demonstration of gas pressure without a container. Your assumption thereafter of atmosphere will require an R value, but that's not what I'm asking for, unfortunately. That's why I did say it gets harder from here to just assert the R value. Might even take these uh, R zombies off. I said that the other yeah. day, and I got yelled at. <laughs> yeah, but at the end of the day, no matter when they start, they're going to have to bring R. Oh, I like that. Explain how is done a... Is it presumably like registered trademark? It comes out looking funky. Let's show you that. He's got his R value. Can you see that? Yes, there it is on screen. Epic. Let's ask that. Any evidence of the R value? That would be Earth radius. R. You're going to need a sphere for that. It's there because it has to be. Why else would we be, as ballers, be chanting R all the time, metaphorically? You're asking me why else would people be chanting that there is an R value, even though anti-flat earthers make a willing choice to employ the R value in spite of knowing that it's been debunked, and globe earthers employ the R value without realising they're begging the question at all. Why would they do that? Unless there was an R value, that was your question, right? That's right. There is an R value. It just only exists in the maths. It doesn't give you a derivative sphere edge horizon. So there is an R value. It just isn't part of our reality. And it's claimed to be derived from a physical sphere edge horizon to give you dip angles and tangent points and geometry. But again, that's not part of our reality because the horizon isn't a physical location to measure dip angles and get tangent points. But without R, reality would only be eality. Okay, very funny. Wow. Wow. What about somebody who claims to have calculated the R value from the quote-unquote circumference of the equator? What's the equator? Actually, I'm not well, going to do this. That, that's, I, I, that's where you'll get them. Then. Just one sec. Just because typically I'm on the side of... Um, defending how you would derive this right. Arwen is typically postulating this, so I'm going to offer up the opportunity for Arwen to actually play the positive flat earth position, just for a change in this regard, if he's Arr? willing. Arr! Well, uh, hold on, let me just fill Arwen in. Somebody's just claimed you get the R value from the... Go ahead, Rams. Oh, some will claim that you can calculate it from assuming the equator to be the circumference 
of the sphere. Well, yeah, that works by assuming it. Oh, for bloody sure. hell's sake. Do you mean that works? I, I was hoping you would challenge him on it as opposed to support him. Well, I'm not going to tell him he can't do that, right? I'll just leave it open for suggestion, you know? It's like the equator line. It's a nice convention based on celestial derivatives. And yeah, I'm not going to tell you that can only happen on a sphere, but you might come to that conclusion by yourself. Even though you gave all the disclaimers that would debunk it in your first breath. Thank you, Arwen. Very sneaky. Very clever. I love it. You're welcome. So, that convention, that construct, that arbitrary point that doesn't really exist derived from the celestial movements, as Arwen has just described, that's not a physical location to measure anything with. It's a construct derived from the movement of lights in the sky. That's what your equator is. Bams. I know you're playing devil's advocate, but yeah. you got any more? <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> oh, come on, don't be that much of a pushover. <laughs> Can't you tell me I don't understand or something? <laughs> no, uh. Oh, it genuinely does look like that's all we're getting. Fair enough. Well, that concludes the housekeeping. Woo! R! Well, there's one more that R1 forgot. Uh, when you take gravity and minus the R, R1, what do we have? Gravity? <laughs> it was just as terrible. There's when... R in a lot of words, guys. A lot of words. If, if if that was to figure out if taking a terrible joke and telling it in your t your tongue <laughs> tenth would make it more funny, it it didn't. No, I'm just in the absence of any ballers and anti flat earthers. Uh, if anyone's been a fan of the show, they've disappeared. So we're left to bad jokes and filling up space because they're gone. The R killed them. Black Swan destroyed them. From January 2020 to now, you can see how they've fallen off. <laughs> I was going to say the edge, but they've fallen off all their arguments. Well, they have fallen off their edge because they were sat on their statement of fact that the horizon was a sphere edge for boats to fall over, and they've now fallen off that claim because they don't have a derivative R value to make the claim. Yeah, it's a devastating argument because there's no workaround. It's either there or it's not. And if it's not, welcome to flat earth. It doesn't change that they're out there still making it. It's just it's much easier to go out there and make it without any challenge from us as opposed to come in and actually challenge us. Because when they come here, we won't allow them to just run their do -si do circle jerk, assert they are, assert how many feet and inches or meters are missing from this building. That's their usual... It's like, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, debunked it. Now what you got? Well, it's like boxing. You know, you want to be the champion, you got to fight the champion. Well, but they go and do all these undercard bouts and, you know, I'm 10 and 0. Yeah, but you're not the world champion. Yeah, but I'm 10 and 0. Yeah, but who'd you fight? You got to fight the champion. Yeah, but I'm still 10 and 0. So they go and they're 10 and 0 because they're not here fighting the champion of the argument, the black swan. You got to come here and beat it, not uh, among your friends or shows that don't hold your feet to the fire. That's a very good point. Ask yourself this, audience. If you're watching an argument that takes place and claims there's a sphere proof to be had, has it actually taken into account the black swan? Because if it hasn't, it's not a valid claim. I.e. if it's a derivative of a begging the question proof of nothing perspective hijacking earth curve calculator with drop or dip measurements or hidden values and that needs an R value and you've got to get a measurement of it and we've debunked it so that entire claim when someone says why are so many feet and inches missing or why are so many meters yeah no you need R to ask me that question you haven't got it anymore so what are you going to do
tell me that the reason so many feet and inches are missing is because the curve calculator with its R value assumption that's been debunked said so? <laughs> no. That's why you don't get them coming in here. They can still make that crappy little claim with us not around. Did you see Flat Toys' latest video? Quite possibly. What's it about? Uh, ranty proving that the black swan is uh, debunked. He debunked the black swan. Did you oh, know sorry, Ranty did? I didn't see the uh, Ranty video. I did see his thumbnail. He claimed he'd debunked the black swan in an hour long video. Right. Well, Flat Soid made a little response to that. It's lovely. Okay, I'll have to check it out. But we yeah, can't... Ranty thinks that the horizon can be refracted with terrestrial refraction, and that would still prove, basically, that the Earth is a sphere. Oh, so, right. Is, that was his yeah. argument. Ah, uh -huh. beautiful. Say it with me, ladies and gentlemen. You're gonna need an R for that, Ranty. It's tough for him because R is the first letter in his name, you know, so... It's, R is very close to his heart. Terrestrial refraction is bending light through the atmosphere. Sphere-shaped air. At a rate of R. So you're going to need R for that. Well, that saved me an hour. <laughs> How quickly he's out there assuming terrestrial refraction when Katz's bum buddy ran away from R so recently. It's the same R that I asked Katz for, Ranty. Have you got it? Of course you haven't, we've debunked it. But you think that you're overcoming it with the same old dusty crap that we've had for the last 18 months that needs R? Oh dear. You're going to need R for your refraction because terrestrial refraction's moving through sphere-shaped air at a rate of R, ranty. Didn't you know? Maybe you should have paid a bit more attention when you're a flat earther. Yeah, and that, that doesn't make sense on its face to say, because terrestrial refraction was always used to loom things with respect to the horizon prior to the black swan. And that's how I understood it, because it had the R value in it. Yes, that's correct. To quote Rumpus, you know it's refracted because of its position with respect to the horizon. Of course, that didn't stop him coming here and lying about that very statement, did it? That's why he's not welcome anymore, because he's a lying scumbag. That would be Rumpus who made it explicitly clear how refraction works with respect to the horizon. Only to later claim that the horizon was also refracted with an R-based refraction that you need R in the first place to use it to paradoxically move the horizon to a non-geometric position. You're all idiots. So the horizon is refracting over a refracted horizon. Nice. Good stuff. Yeah, don't get Good much morning, better guys. than that. Paradox. Sorry, chocolate. Yeah, it's beautiful. They think that they can determine the geometry by measuring something using optics when it is actually already being displaced by the assumed value well, that you assume it is half the thing you're looking at, right? So they basically pre-assume. You can't get more presuppositional than this. To assume what you're looking at is a sphere and then to adapt what you actually see to that assumption. That is terrestrial refraction and it is a paradox. Right. Can't move the horizon with an R based refraction if the R based refraction is based on a tangent point horizon. So, to do the Earth geometry, the Earth sphere geometry, it's based on having a tangent to that horizon. That's how the geometry is performed. So as soon as you move the horizon or refract the horizon, regardless of the fact that Ranty's refracting it with R, you then can't have your tangent point because it's moved and been refracted, debunking the geometry from within. In other words, Ranty's current claim of terrestrial refraction moving the horizon was the very thing that was laid as a bear trap by Quantum Eraser when he intentionally used bendy cranes in the picture rather than the crystal clear ones that he had plenty of options to use. Well, that's so that you can say refraction because the moment you say it, you debunk the geometry. If the horizon's refracted, it's not geometric, Ranty. Idiot. Seems like he didn't get that all this time that he spent over here. 
Oh, he was Funny. bracing against it the whole time because he wanted to transition across to Globe. So he was like, I don't like the Black Swan. Really? Well, not liking it meant you didn't pay enough attention, did you, Ranty? Because if the horizon's refracted, it's not geometric, you complete bonehead. If you're, if you're a flat earther and you don't like the black swan and you've heard the responses that the globe side and the anti-flat earth side have given to the black swan and you still don't like it, then you just don't get it. It's pretty apparent. Yeah, pretty apparent he didn't get it. Or he wouldn't be saying, oh, well, terrestrial refraction can move it. Oh, yeah, that's refraction based on an atmosphere for light to bend through. At a rate of R. Oh, where'd you get your R value? Run, little kitten. Run fast. Maybe you can ask cats, Ranty. Sniff cats ass and ask him where he got R. Yeah? Same question I asked him. See what he tells you. So check out Flatzoid video as that was the uh, inspiration for that little conversation. As apparently he's done a nice little response to it. Not that I've seen it myself, but uh, anybody else here see yeah, it? Yeah, I'll post it in the, in the YouTube chat. So subscribe today. Also, it's worth plugging in because he's, a, he's growing as a YouTuber, is Flatzoid. His editing skills are improving, as is his audio quality and the subject quality. It's all going uphill at a fairly exponential rate. So it's good stuff. Um, subscribe today to Flatzoid. He's gained fair few subscribers the... as a result as well. It does show that if you put in the effort, you will grow. What was the response when Mitchell from Australia debated that guy? The best you've done. Arwin, 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 Arwin. Huh? What? We can hear you clickety clacking. Oh, sorry. I thought, oh, I didn't know I was still. <laughs> Unmuted, sorry. Okay. Time, time, man. At best, what you've done here is debunk the radius. Yes. Always on cue, chocolate. Yeah, that's right. Well, that, was his, that was his opening statement out of the gate for him. So <laughs> uh, that was a shit career. <laughs> Your first statement that we even are aware of is at best, what you've done is debunk the radius. Hmm. <laughs> now, what I like better than that is the other guy that said, yeah, Nathan Oakley says we assume a sphere. That's correct. Beautiful. Oh, uh, just Phil? Yes. <laughs> yeah, him. Yeah. We already know it's of a sphere. Of course we presuppose a sphere. So we come up with a map, don't you know? <laughs> hey, what's wrong with these people? Are y'all serious? <laughs> The best one was Akuma virus. Akuma virus, you say? While I fill in time, while a child is screaming, no doubt? Yeah, um... <laughs> he said, uh... He said, of course, uh... There's an R value. Why else would you be asking me about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Arwen did that earlier. He's like, well, it must exist if people are talking about it and it exists even, he didn't say this, but even as a reification, that means it exists in name only. You know, it's like, yeah, of course. In the same way time dilation in Narnia really does exist. You can't challenge me on it. You can't say, no, time dilation does not happen in Narnia. But like, yeah, it does. You go through the wardrobe and you grow up, but if you came back, you'd still be a kid. Well, you know, that's not going to be disputable. The problem is we don't live in Narnia, do we? I thought that might have been the best uh, globe tard comeback of all time. <laughs> we wouldn't be talking about it otherwise, so it must exist. So, yeah, well, by that standard, I just need to talk about unicorns. And that's somebody that considers themselves so smart. Did, did he follow that up with, you know, you see how I'm, I'm attacking your argument, right? <laughs> what the hell? Nathan, did, did I just hear you say we need to get someone to come out of the closet to prove time dilation? No, I wasn't bashing any homosexuals out there. Far from it. I was uh -huh. saying that the wardrobe, not closet, is what you have to go through in order to experience the time dilation in Narnia. Which is true and real, and you cannot dispute that. 
I mean, I will stand here, hand on heart, and say nobody can challenge me on that fact about Narnia. We don't live there, and it doesn't affect us at all. It's inconsequential to our everyday life. Likewise, pseudo Romanian for space time, the bending thereof known as gravity, is inconsequential to your life. Like going through the wardrobe's inconsequential, it's not somewhere that exists. A description only. Likewise, our value. Yeah, there's an Earth sphere radius value. Absolutely. It just is inconsequential to your actual existence. It's not actual in terms of you looking out the horizon and being able to measure the physical sphere edge that you're looking at. It isn't. That's not what the horizon is. Well, apparently it's no longer a physical sphere edge for bolts and buildings to be blocked out by. As told to us by the same people who believe that it's a physical sphere edge for bolts and buildings to be blocked out by. Funny that. Somebody wants to join. Is anybody willing to give up their place in the live stream chat? As I think somebody else is trying to get onto the live stream chat. Hopefully someone will drop into the after show so we can open up a space. Apparently somebody's got proof of the globe. Open up Yay. the space. Space is opened up. Don't you know, Branson and them, they've gone there. No, not that space. And there's see just... the curvature. Thank you, Neil. Hold on one sec. There's a gap now. So there's 12 people in this 13 spaces, so there's a gap if somebody wants to join. Hopefully they'll open up their mic pretty quick. I don't see anybody joining. Well, we'll see. Proof of the globe, you say? Who's cat sending in now? <laughs> it's not cats, it's the boss. Death sending somebody our way. I assume it's the real death. Hey, hey guys, if uh, Nathan's going to beat somebody up, as, as, uh, even if you smell blood in the water, don't attack. Let Just, just let Nathan kill him. Yes, we know, but sometimes it's hard. What if we want to? What if we want a leg? Is that is that oh you, Globe Believer J J Mez? Oh no, I'm a full Oh, oh, it's still one gap. Okay. Oh, I just thought something funny. Uh, I'm sure the last guy is a flat earther, but can you imagine if? Someone wanted to come on as a global believer and the last minute got scared and he said, are you going? No, I'm a flat earther. <laughs> <laughs> it's showtime. Oh, okay, I'm a flat earther when it's showtime, but in chat, I'm a glober. Well, this is not joining. I mean, we might as well go through the, the motions of sort of the new regime in terms of how friendly we'll be with these people. And that is establish immediately whether or not they're a anti-flat earther or actual normal globe believing person out in the real world because there's a distinct difference between the two right absolutely i was thinking, I was thinking yesterday like should, maybe i don't know we've already been kind of used to calling them anti-flat earthers but aren't they really like anti-globers well that's why i said anti Yes, I, I had this out with Adam, and Adam was saying the same thing and wanted to rebrand it anti-glober. I'm like, well, number one, that makes no sense to an onlooker. But this anti-flat earther kind of spells out what they are. They're against flat earth. But the reason you've got flat earth in their name is because, yes, many of their arguments align with our arguments, hence there's flat earther in their name. Uh, okay, okay, I get that. Yeah, the whole point is to get uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson to debate cats. Or Neil deGrasse Tyson to debate uh, who's the guy that were trying to last week? Nathan. Who's holding an anti? Hillbilly Blue Balls. Hillbilly Blue Balls. Simon Dan. Yeah. Whoever pick your yeah. pick your anti flat earther. Yeah, perfect. So we want to put the globe argument, the globe argument against these people. <laughs> they're both, they're both globers, but they have opposite opposite views i wonder why because one of them why slipped, someone one of them slipped down the slope of anti-flat earth and wants to scramble back up to the top 
but realises that there's an overcome for the argument that normies who have no real consideration for it think is the case. That would be Earth turning underneath stuff. Yeah, but I wonder why somebody on that side would actually take on Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, NDT for short, and say, hey, listen, we have Earth-based Coriolis, but we can never prove it. And why'd you have to go say that football, because of Earth turning underneath, went through the goalposts? Why'd you have to do that, huh? Because that's the globe birth rhetoric. Because that's the actual claim. The globe claims we have 15 degrees an hour drift as Earth turns underneath stuff not attached. That would be moving through the inertial reference frame with us attached to a non-inertial spinning reference frame, watching things appear to move off course from our perspective because we're turning beneath them. That's what the globe actually claims. Now, obviously, if you're turning beneath an aeroplane and from the aeroplane you're looking down and the Earth's slowly, slowly turning beneath you, as is claimed by the globe, then the flight time would be shortened when travelling west. Ergo, uh, if the Earth was turning beneath a flight from Charlotte to North, uh, North Carolina to Los Angeles, then the flight would take about an hour and a half because Earth would be turning beneath it. Now, that does not happen. Earth is not turning beneath anything we'd notice if it was. Now, when we point that out, the anti-flat Earther steps in and goes, No! Earth's not turning underneath. Completely contrasting the actual globe claim that it does. We wouldn't see any drift under a hot air balloon. Really? Well, there's supposed to be 15 degrees in a bit, says the globe. So they're contrasting the actual globe claim. Hence their name, Anti-Flat Earther. Flat Earth is still in their name because they're basically making the same claim as us. No drift to see, you say. So do we. I have something on that. Uh... Because with them, whether you're uh, saying, you know, we see deviation as the earth turns underneath or everything turns together, you're still assuming it's all turning, that there's a turning happening. That, that's the importance of the Coriolis argument for them. They don't, they just want to beg the question that there is an axis for earth. And that would be measured in radians, would it not? Oh, yeah, you damn right it would be. What are you going to need for that, John? You'll, you'll need an R value for that. Oh, so to start off making a claim that Earth's spinning at a particular rate, you're going to need an R value. I see. You hear that, Fundies? That stony silence from your own side when it's R value related. Yeah, that's not going to go away. I was going to say, we, we have a great example, though, of... Uh one of these anti-flat earth clowns who, you know, go against their globe religion as uh, George Wooster sat down with fight the tight shirt, right? Because how many times did he tell us that gravity is a force before that discussion that they had? And as the priest, uh, George, Georgie fucking Wooster, uh, <laughs> basically told Craig, it's literally not a force. You have to just agree. Oh, yeah, it's not a force. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, put up against their priest. They, they don't go against the weather. Hey, Chocolate, uh, fight the tight shirt. You're going to need R for that. Okay. But yes, that's correct, Chocolate. And for that reason, I have noticed personally that they are in a separate category. They're not in the same group as the people who talk about. How wonderful Earth looks from a moonrise picture or whatever it's called, Earthrise. You know, that's a section of society that they'll never get back to. They will always be a sub subjugated, if that's the right word, uh, it's a sec section of society that has been put into a group. Not just part of the rest of the globe believing normies anymore. Anti flat Earther. Yeah. It's kind of incredible, right? And then to think that afterwards, I don't know, almost a year afterwards, he came here and told us that, you know, it, gravity is a force colloquially, but it's created by what we call the force of gravity. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a, that's a head fuck, <laughs> if I've ever heard one. Force of gravity creates the force of gravity. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, we got a lot of nonsense from him. I think the thing I held him to task on was tangent planes that he was assuming. And I, you know, it all descended into chaos at the point that I asked him where he got the tangent from. <laughs> yeah, you're going to need R for that.
I was about to say, there's a lot of things you need R for, but I'm going to change that to you need R for everything sphere related. Yeah, any positive claim you're going to make on the, uh, the deals with the globe will require R to make it. Yeah, spot on. Every single claim to be proof of a sphere will start with an assumption of the R value. Well, that'd, be, that'd be horrible for him if it was debunked, wouldn't it? It is debunked. Black Swan. Yeah, that must be horrible for him then. It must be. You that's, know. Why, that's why it only exists in the math, because it doesn't exist in reality. So when's this going to get dealt with, I ask myself? When, when are they actually going to start taking their head out of the sand and saying, okay, here's how we now acquire the R value? Because other than R when playing devil's advocate and saying they get it from a, for a, a presupposed circumference on an outside edge of a presupposed sphere that they're deriving lights in the sky to give them an arbitrary position on the ground. That's the best we've had, literally, and that's come from Arwin for the most part. Well, they're, they're never going to get it because, as John has said in the past, once they get it, they're no longer uh, Glovers or anti-flat earthers. They become, you know, like you said, welcome to flat earth if they get it. Now, they're, these are the same people who first have to figure out a straight line that's been curved. Now, if you can't even get that, how are you going to get the art argument? Uh, imagine the, the pain. <laughs> the cognitive pain it must you you someone must go through to tell you to ask you why you would expect to see something that they've asserted themselves that is actually physical and seen and capable of blocking boats and buildings. Uh, imagine imagine the pain you have to go through for that. Yeah, and then the pain that you'd have to go through to rearrange that into why would you, and that's me as a globe earther talking to a flat earther why would you mr flat earther think we've got a sphere edge horizon nobody's ever claimed that <laughs> you're like how much pain have you got to go through <laughs> to process it into that hey adam afternoon good to have you not bad all good sobered up since saturday night no, it was all good. I hope so. Apart from when you attacked a flat, fellow flatty just for asking a reasonable question. <laughs> it was very amusing. Well, it felt like it wasn't. If You know, you know when you misinterpret what someone's saying in there, uh, it felt like it was a baller thing. Uh, and then, yes. All these statements, have you got any more citations? You're like, more? You want more? You don't even need one. <laughs> well, you did. <laughs> well, that bit, I was frustrated at him. Yeah, because genuinely, he's getting mugged off. Yeah, he, uh, they, they, the ballers go, oh, more citations, and off you go. Instead of dealing with why they need more, if you see what I mean, that was. Nah, yeah. you, you're you're already mad because point three owed you money. Damn and, right, uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> so you already take my that. So I, I, yeah, I, the... I even heard. I was like, wow, Adam is Adam is like going at him right now like okay it's okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's nothing wrong like with it savage there... by a dead sheep though by me it's not <laughs> got a thought... renewing next show to the adam meekin show it was reasonable to take that standpoint with him and although he the, the tone might not have been necessarily correct i've i've made that mistake plenty of times so i'm not going to give you grief over that but i completely agree with you it's like i even said it on the show i don't even give citations ever why? Well, because I haven't got a desk in front of me. I haven't got a keyboard in front of me. I've got my little box, my Stream Deck box. That's what I've got. So am I in a position right now to go and Google search something? No, definitely not. Well, do I? No. <laughs> I mean, that's why I'm like, can one of you post it in Ball Busters? Why? Well, because then I can just point at it, click at it, and it'll come up on the screen. <laughs> I don't have to type anything. I don't have to do anything. It's just, you know, that's how it is. But that methodology came the moment i heard qe say well you don't actually need to cite anything ever i was like you don't no it's just to just support of your argument so i'm like okay so it's just the argument that really matters take it or leave it right you don't like my argument i'm not going to give you any citations who's your citation me this is my argument take it or leave it 
But why would you need a citation for the scientific method? That's what I didn't understand. This is the method. This is what it is. That's it. No, that, that was kind of my point. Is that yeah, because if he's going to have a citation. Oh, he's here. Hold on, Adam. Go ahead, Max. It was you that was. Well, well, I just finish the you have to, they, they want more citations because you, anyone can make the scientific method. Uh, you can have four methods. You can have six criteria. So they they just wanted more and more and more. So I just wanted to give him No, some. there's one scientific so, method. I'm sorry. Okay, hold on. It was Adam, supposed to be even if there was it's, two or three. It's, it's, Everyone, it's hold on. Let me just get some order. Right hold on. Now. Hello, hello. I don't want it to send it to chaos. Just let Adam respond. Then we'll get back to you. I promise. Max. So, even if there was two or three, um, I think I'm kind of agreeing with you, Nathan. The point there is if they want, if we've, we've got a, a, a statement of what we understand the method to be, if they want to argue with it, the way that I'm not responding is for them to come to me and go, go and find some alternatives and let's let's you then discuss with yourself, basically. They want to bring an alternative citation of the method. We'll happily go through it like we did on Saturday and point out point three and how nonsensical it is in terms of understanding of the scientific method. So I'd put it back at their door, dude, is 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 the thing I'd reiterate again because otherwise they're just mugging you off, getting yeah, sending you on fool's errands. Is yeah, he's already said it. He said like even if you give it to them, what are they going to say? Science doesn't prove things afterwards, right? <laughs> so they're, they're like I said, I told him on Saturday, they're just spinning his wheels, asking for citations for the science method. Come on, you guys, you, the very same people that were asserting the science four or five years ago, right? Now that, that was Tim Panda. Tim Panda wanted me to go off and find more citations to, uh, about to back him. up what I was saying about the scientific method. Yeah, Jim Panda will Scott ask you for citations all day and, and never pay any of mine to them. No, but right? when you do, when you do chocolate, then you got a guy like freaking M. Scott Veach saying that that's just the basic science. We've advanced. Okay, that's uh, what you get with that. Excuse me, I have a question about this. Uh, how do you create a binary of if A, then B, if A, not B, in any other way other than the scientific method? Because that's the only way it can be empirical. That's spot on. Right? Do you understand so, what John so, just asked? You have two mutually exclusive positions in the hypothesis. One is called the alternative, the other is called the null. The, the alternative is if A, then B, i.e. A is your assumed cause, B is the effect you are studying, and you have assumed correctly the cause of the effect. Ergo, when you vary that effect, uh, sorry, when you vary that cause, it causes the effect. That's if A, then B, a supposition of a causal relationship. That's called an alternative. You also have a null. The antithesis of that prediction. So rather than if A then B, your null is if A not B. So I vary A, B does not happen. Now those two things cannot occur simultaneously. It violates the law of non-contradiction. You can't have A both cause B and not cause B at the same time. They are both mutually exclusive positions. Now what John is pointing out is that is what offers the empiricism in the method. At the end of experiment, that's actualization of the hypothesis. The hypothesis being if A then B or if A not B. You just vary A and see which one's true. True being proven. So upon experimentation, either A or B will be proven. Either A will cause B or A will not cause B when you vary it. So, that's the empiricism on offer from science. So when you're told by someone like M. Scott Beach, that's just the basic science. Basic? All right. So you think there's something better than empiricism? Knowing? Proving? I don't think so. Actually, that makes the method quite limited. Well, that limitation offers empiricism. It doesn't mean that you can expand it out into vague correlations and just so stories and say that it's been advanced because it hasn't you can't get better than empiricism and upon experimentation you will prove 
your hypothesis to be true or false. That would be it causes it or it does not cause it. One or other will be proven true. Empirical. Thank you, John. Excellent point. Some, some yeah, guy there is, left yeah, brain. We're talking about uh, another clown that thinks you can do science on a sneaker. He's put, in, so. he's put many variations within the above. So I've listed the seven steps to the scientific method. And he's also said that's not what they are saying. They are saying we can't show anything is real. What does that mean? We can't show anything is real? What? That well, means he doesn't wow. understand the method, doesn't it? He's, but by that de de declaration, it shows Nathan's just gone through the method. So that even if you experiment, you don't ER, disappointingly, it. It didn't it. work, you know, I didn't prove my hypothesis. In doing so, because of the empirical way you set up the experiment, it proves you're null. So you do prove things. Yeah. It might not be the thing you want to prove, but the experiment, if set up properly, will prove something we know we know why they say that they have to say that we covered it in the earlier show true Science? just from just from sorry tenth just from max's benefit you, you don't have to assume that we're attacking you i know adam had had a couple when he was doing it on the show and misinterpreted what yeah, was I know. but I know, you, I know. You, you just find yourself in a position of devil's advocacy in other words you're going to have to represent your opponent's position to us and when we yeah. challenge it, it seems like we're challenging you. We're not. Just so you know. Nah, all, all I'm asking is, can you send me more citations? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair no. enough. And all we're saying is you don't need to listen. You. I'm going to tell yeah. you something about Jen Panda. Stay away from there. That's a poisonous well and a dead-end street. Tell them to demonstrate or show you some sort of curvature. If not, next. May I finish? You can. All right. We're get, we, we've heard this for years now. They have to go there because it's not their reality. So when, when the empirical method shows their model is not reality and they don't want to do the right thing at this moment and say, oh my gosh, we don't have R. They have to go to the next step of lying to themselves to say science doesn't prove things. This is normal for someone who doesn't want to deal with the facts. All they have on the globe side is a model. We test the model, it doesn't match reality. Then they say, science doesn't prove things. <laughs> well, the, hold on a sec. When they say science doesn't prove things, it's just because they're science deniers. That's why they're saying it. That's, you would have to deny something proven to really? deny. Th that is literally the definition of science denial science does not prove things is literally science denial right that's what i'm saying they're science deniers when they say that it doesn't prove things yeah. yeah all science does is prove things either you prove you know or your alternative when you actualize a hypothesis what's actualization of a hypothesis you ask it's called an experiment it's where you vary your presumed cause and see if it affects what you are trying to induce. That's the observed phenomena that you observed at step one. That's what an experiment is. That's the actualization of your hypothesis. And upon doing so, you will prove something. It's all it does because you can't have if A, then B, and if A, not B, simultaneously occurring at once. Only one will be true at the end of the process. Ergo, you prove something. That's what it does. So to say science doesn't prove things, you're denying the essence of what science does. It's designed to elucidate the cause of an effect. This is a most recent uh, comeback from them, because for hundreds, if not longer, years, they've used science, hijacked it, for their globe model. When we challenge the model, with true science, then they say, well, we can't, now we gotta turn against the word science because uh, our model doesn't fan out in reality. But we can, gotta keep our model. That's why can, they're doing it. Can, can we hear one of my favorite globe clowns uh, say himself, Nathan and uh, Master B? Uh, I'll have a look. Sorry, I'm not on the happens ball. to be a guy who's who's got all types of science on his channel. 
Hmm. For years and years, he's had all these videos it talking is about a three dimensional and... spheroid. However, I don't know that, and it has not been proven. Science doesn't prove anything. Ah, Mr. Weak Sauce. <laughs> science doesn't prove anything, Mr. Weak Sauce, with all the videos on your channel about how science and how science works on your globe. But all of a sudden, science doesn't prove things. This is one of the globe priests, the clown. Who's telling people that science has approved things? So what is he talking about? Why does he have all this quote unquote science on his channel? This is the okie doke, man. This is the banana and the tailpipe. And now they're turning tail because they've realized their pseudoscience doesn't prove anything. This is why these clowns will tell us this crap. Because for years and years, science proves the globe, science proves our body of science, body of science. Shout out to Rumpus, shout out Retracted Clown. <laughs> What the hell's wrong with you people? Yes, that's correct. It's the okidoka, or whatever you called it. Step one, train children at a very early age that science does prove things. Teach them how it's an empirical method. Explain it. At some level, get them to understand that when the word of science is employed, it actually does prove things. Further to that, have in the same classroom, under the same heading, and often in the same textbook, descriptions of what is, by definition, pseudoscience used alongside the empirical method that they've just been taught. From then on in, use the magical words of science, experiment, phenomena, theory, and imply your just-so story and explanation for a phenomena that you haven't validated is actually the proof that is required and hint at empiricism when you don't actually have any. Further to that, when your claim to be science is shown to be wrong you declare that science doesn't prove things because you hadn't got any in the first place. So Vsauce and what's all the science he's talking about, well, none of it was science at all. Very little that is claimed to be science is science. Even the published documents that have gone through peer review, 99.9% .9 of them are not science. But they're probably headed science and science is the department that they'll have been put through. Doesn't mean that they are, doesn't mean that they've gone through the method. Look up the definition of pseudoscience. A claim of science that has not been through the scientific method. Well, if their claim hasn't been through the scientific method, it by definition is pseudoscience. But they're going to tell you it's science, and when it's proven wrong, tell you science doesn't prove things? No, Vsauce is a science denier. Plain and simple. Science doesn't prove things, that's all it does. Proves the cause of your effect, or proves that you didn't get it right. You varied your presumed cause, and it didn't cause the effect. You proved it wasn't that. Or you proved it was. You're going to prove something at the end of that process, though, Vsauce. You're a science denier. Well, a lot of times it's... It... Sorry. I was just going to say, he started off the statement with, it's, you know, talking about his clover. It's a three-dimensional spheroid. And then immediately chases that with, but I don't know that. Oh, you, you don't know that. Hmm. How many videos does he have on his channel <laughs> where he's telling you how what he doesn't know actually is reality? And now all of a sudden, he doesn't know that. But he, he, just, he said this on an interview with some other guy. I wonder if he ever went back to his channel and made a nice video like, Hey, guys, you know all these videos I had prior to, to today? Uh, I don't know any of this because science doesn't prove anything. So maybe disregard all the videos that I've had for years and years teaching people how this is nonsense. And this nonsense is reality. Well, that, that is the concept. Yeah, we're we're talking about nothing, uh, nothing. Uh, hold on, just ago, That's what my son said. Science doesn't... I, I remember this before Flat Earth. My son telling me that science doesn't prove things. It really just disproves. So that, that's the logic they, they have. Sure. The question I find more interesting, Chocolate, is why would you disclaim that? So obviously if he's putting out video after video after video about how Earth is a sphere and how things are demonstrably the case in his begging the question assumption of a sphere in the first instance in every claim. Beyond that, you go, well, obviously he thinks he's on a sphere then. So when push comes to shove and he's being questioned on it, why wouldn't he just say, yeah, of course it's a sphere? Why would he disclaim, well, I don't actually know that. Why not? Well, because there's nothing empirical. Science doesn't prove things. Why would you make that disclaimer? 
It's like, mm, do you appreciate that what you've been claiming as science, that would be empirically validated cause and effect relationships, isn't proving things? Do you know? And it might come to a head in your lifetime, perhaps? So when yeah. push comes to shove and you've been asked if you know whether or not that's the case, better off covering your ass and saying you don't actually know, but blaming science? Mm, very interesting yeah. disclaimer, in my opinion. Yeah, it's an out. Yeah, yeah, when I when I heard this statement, I was just like, wait, hold up. <laughs> Are you serious, Mr. Weak Sauce? How the hell did you just say that? How did you fix your face to just say that when all your, your whole channel is about how science and all this nonsense works on a globe? Well, now this here method... in an interview, you're just going to say, oh, I don't know that. <laughs> so, Dave, <laughs> what? Go ahead. So, Chocolate, they've uh, brought down the scientific method so it can only disprove things so the scientific method in their world now uh, affirms the null only never the alternative um if you're disproving something aren't you proving something else exactly chocolate precisely anyway i'm going to shout out james richard who said globies are actually what they project flat earthers to be i couldn't agree more so where they call us cult members that's precisely what they are they've found themselves rolling down the hill away from their cult and they want to be in it and so they project that straight onto us while they scramble to become part of their cult again absolutely correct thank you very much for the uh, super chat james richard uh, what i was going to say though is uh, a lot of times they confuse philosophy like the um, a materialistic philosophy with science so that um that that's where their confusion stems from. They think that only things that are physical and natural can exist. But, but my thing is like, this is not somebody who should be confused. This is a guy who's got, I don't know how many subs, but plenty of subs listening to him teach people about science and how that science works on a globe. So to me, it's incredible that somebody like this would go on some interviews, some guy's interview and just basically claim yeah it's a 3d sphere right? but i don't know that uh that's not been proven because science doesn't prove things oh okay so you just negated everything that i've seen on your channel ever ever thanks with that i'm going to say if you are watching this on either nathan oakley 1980 or nathan oakley premiering streams then stay tuned as there will be an after show to follow unfortunately if you are watching this live this is where we bid you farewell so a huge massive enormous thank you to both discord and g plus panels for making today's live show possible and another massive thank you to all of you smashed the super chat liked commented shared subscribed joined as an nathan oakley 98 channel member and all that good stuff once again stay tuned if you're watching on a premiering stream i've been nathan oakley and i will see you all in the next video Drum guy for smashing the super chat just after the live stream had ended. Oh, well, um, science only disproves thing. Would that be okay? I only heard the end um, of that, Brian. Start say that statement again because I only just transitioned. Oh, sorry, Nathan. Uh, could I clear up that um, whole science only disproves things uh, claim? That, uh, that we had heard for years and now we hear science doesn't prove anything. Um, if you were, uh, I, we went through this before, I, I remember saying this before, and uh, QE agreed, um, so it's after being verified by QE, um, that uh, if you see a natural effect and you want to find the natural cause of it, you might end up ha having to do six, seven, maybe eight um, um, tests, um, experiments. Um, to find out the actual cause. And you might have, you're more likely going to have 
a multiple of nulls before you find your positive. You know, you're going to disprove more things than you'll prove. Like before you, sorry, before you'll actually prove the cause, the natural cause of the natural effect. You're going to go to a load of different things. I think it's this thing. Turns out it's not. I think it's this other thing. It's not. I think it's this other thing. It's not. I think it's this other thing. It's not. Then you go, oh, it's this thing. And then you don't have to ask the question anymore. You know, because the scientific method, it, it gives you a solid answers and not more questions. You know, so this whole thing about science only disproves things, that comes from a complete lack of understanding of what, of what science experiments, of how you would find a natural cause, what, what you're doing, what the scientific method is. It's a complete lack of understanding of that. And their the lack of understanding, understanding has gotten worse because now they're saying it doesn't prove anything, including disproving. I just see it as another magic trick with words, which, funny enough, they say the meanings of don't have, you know, the definitions of have no meaning, right? Because, yes. I mean, like, if you were to prove or disprove that acid causes water to boil, you've proven that acid doesn't cause water to boil. Uh, that's just English. Oh, this is, I'm just <laughs> reading Forbes' <laughs> description on this, guys. Uh, I'll, I'll post it in a minute. But that, I think this is the, the crux of what their argument, Chocolate, is, is that, yes, in the empirical experiment now, yes, it does prove that. But in the future, we might discover something where acid could make water to boil. So therefore, we can't categorically say it's proof. That seems to be their caveat on these things. Yeah, anything is possible kind of kind of nonsense. Yeah, yeah. 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 And maybe <laughs> some point acid won't burn your skin when you pour it on it. You know, maybe that won't happen. How maybe will we find that out? You know, that's well, complete like utter a, rubbish. Sorry, John. I was going to say all they got is an appeal to the future fallacy is what they got, is what you're telling me. Except, except when you're yes. talking about things, and it's not science, but except when you're talking about things that you can observe now, you don't need the future to to know that the quote unquote horizon is an apparent position. But yet, no matter how much you tell them and show them, and they now declare it to us, they won't accept that. They, well, they the whole think it's a physical fear. Like what the hell? The the going <laughs> the going trend is we've science the blank out of this. Right. I mean, that's just a going trend. So to, only to find out after sciencing the blank out of this, we've proved nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we should have sciencing the blank out of this. You, you know, it's the, like Adam was saying there where uh, they can state that, uh, how do you know in the future we won't find out that acid makes causes water to boil? That's another complete misunderstanding of scientific method. The whole point of, as I said earlier, the whole point of scientific method is it gives you solid answers, not more questions. So you don't have to go back 100 years later and go, actually, this happens in a different way. No, you don't have to do all that. It tells you the answer. When you go through the process, you find out the answer for definite. And then that's the end of that question. You don't I can't need to remember, find it out. I can't Sorry, remember the quote on. comes from, but it's something along the lines of science distinguishes itself from other fields of inquiry because of its requirement for systematic experimentation. That's pretty much verbatim, and I can't tell you who said it. But there we go. So the systematic experimentation is the bit where you repeat it over and over and over and over again to make sure that A always causes B. So in other words, you're only going to repeat it if you're validating your alternative. That would be to say that your supposition of cause, A, does actually cause the phenomena you're going to be studying that would be b so a causes b well let's vary a and make it cause b and you vary a and it causes b and then it's done again and again and again and again and again to make sure that that is actually the case so the systematic experimentation stage is the continued verification of that supposition of cause as valid nathan you said it saturday Oh, I said what? <laughs> what you just said, the whole thing about science. You said, I don't know who said it. I said, you said it Saturday on Ballbusters. No, it's a quote. It's not me that said that. 
I might have said it on Saturday, but it's certainly not me that said it originally. Kui would know who that quote came from originally. I don't remember who came from originally. Well, it, a lot of their <laughs> problems... Like that... Sorry, did somebody say to me who it was? Did somebody know? Uh, I'm thinking... Uh, I could be... I um, might be wrong. I think it's that Professor Shinko. But I could be wrong. Because there's a couple of those guys. <laughs> I don't know exactly which one. Okay. So, yeah, could be Dr. Shankar, but there we go. We'll, we'll establish it at a later date if QB turns up. Well, um, what I was going to say is, uh, like with the black swan, the black swan is proving a positive claim false, right? Uh, so you can prove things in other ways without experimentation, but they, they, they've confused observation with experimentation and think that they can just look at things and disprove their way to the truth is I, I think where they're trying to reason themselves from well something i was thinking about just as when john mentioned black swan there so i was thinking about there over the weekend <clears throat> they started calling because they've just offhand just called when he went when they took the, their black blackpool uh swan photo um, well, not them, the photographer Kevin Jackson. They went out to take a photograph all from, a, from the same area, same place, and he got very much a similar photograph, with exceptions of the clarity, you know, and other things. But they, he just said, it's just, a, it's just a white swan. Like, it's just the same as the other, of all other photographs in here. It's just no big deal. Kind of, that was what Bev was, that was the direction, that's what he was talking about. That's what he was nodding at. No big deal. It was just an offhand comment. And they started calling their observation the white swan it's like it, it, you're missing the point the whole point of Karl popper's analogy was that if you're claiming some that all swans are white then one black one disproves that right and they call it a white swan completely disproving what i mean is that calling it a white swan after the black swan had, had come out makes it completely pointless. You're it's basically a, saying, yeah, there's yeah, nothing yeah. to look at here. It's the, it's the level of village idiot. So <laughs> someone comes along to the town um, that's infested with white swans. They're everywhere. They're just really common. They are here, actually. We've got loads of swans in Leamington. Most of them white. Anyway, guy comes up and says, you do realise that not all of those swans are white. And the village idiot says, of course they're all white. Look. They're all white. And the guy goes in his bag and pulls out a black swan. And goes, here you go, village idiot. Look, here's a swan. It's black. He then puts the black swan back in his bag. Metaphorically speaking. And the, the village idiot goes, scratches his head, <laughs> reaches over to his side and goes, look, a white swan. <laughs> You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that didn't change before or after I showed you that black swans do exist. Showing me another white swan won't change that black swans exist. You just saw one. So what your argument is now to show me a, a white swan? Are you insane? Yeah, yeah. We're really thick people that we're dealing with, Brian. Yeah. And then, and then if they don't see the black swan, if they, did, if they didn't happen to see the black swan that you just put back in your bag, they'll deny the existence of the black swan, which is hilarious because that's the black swan fallacy that we've been charged with, which is what they do when they're charging with us with it, <laughs> which is freaking fantastic. <laughs> you got to love that shit. It's, it's obvious we're going to just keep talking about this forever because of their responses to good questions. But let's dig down and get the motive. The motive is... I can't use science anymore to prove the globe. So I've got to discredit science because I will never give up the globe. This is where they're at. All their arguments has to do with the cult that they're in. They can't deny the evidence of the black swan. So they go and say, well, let's attack it from this point of view. And then we'll even say science doesn't prove things to attack other arguments from that point of view. They have to keep doing this because any amount of evidence you show them, they have to admit that they've been in the heliocentric cult all these years and they don't want to do that. That's the real problem. 
Whereas other yeah, people, to, to, whereas other people the, like John, the minute he realized he couldn't measure uh, the dip angle and the whole Al Baruni story fell apart, he says, you know what? You can't measure it. It's calculated. The earth is flat. He got it because he's not defending anything. He, he, he so, wanted to know. So all, all the new people, just go back. Go back to the early episodes, man. When these clowns came here and told us every day that science proves the ball, right? Rumpus himself has said it. There are videos two minutes long, three minutes long of Rumpus just saying, body of science proves this, body of science proves that, right? Body of science proves gas pressure without a container, body of science proves R, body of science proves everything, right? For years and years and years. So why all of a sudden today, this clown were to show up here, he would say, well, science doesn't prove things. As a matter of fact, he did show up one day and said science doesn't prove things. And I asked him, I said, wait a minute, aren't you the same guy that came here for two years and told us that the body of science proves everything? What do you mean? What are you talking about? Uh, yeah, I, I didn't mean it proves anything because, you know, science doesn't prove. I mean, <laughs> this is where they're at, which is why they're not here. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. Well, you know, the reason, like, my arguments prior to the Black Swan solely dealt in measurements because i understood that if you can't measure it it doesn't physically exist that's well, that that's your bad for knowing science, the difference between a measurement and a if calculation science doesn't, if science doesn't prove things what what proves things are you asking us like we're globers? Well, n nothing. There's no no proof of anything. We might as well be a brain in a jar at that point, according to a glober. Now, if I could address this, I'm... Uh, oh no, and you go first. Yeah, yeah, I just got back. But science doesn't prove anything, but the body of science does. <laughs> yeah, right. There you go. How's that, Sasha? There's your global globe head uh, response. Yeah, that that's on. That's that's true, even. Uh, no, science does prove things. The body of science is actually pseudoscience repackaged. No, but the, the world in what, what we live, it's full of body of science. Yeah, that's right. I think. Okay. Go on, Adam. Everyone else, be quiet, please. Go ahead, Adam. I've got a, a feeling that they're misinterpreting their own gurus. Um, if I could just read this passage, I think what? they're misinterpreting is what an experiment proves um, and it's empiricism and then how you then extrapolate that bloody phone uh, how you then extrapolate that to a theory uh, a scientific theory so if i can just quote einstein the scientific theorist is not to be envied for nature or more precisely experiment is an inexhaustible and not very friendly judge of his work it never says yes to a theory. In the most favourable cases, it says maybe, and in the great majority of cases, simply no. If an experiment agrees with a theory, it means for the latter maybe, and it does. And if it does not agree, it means no. Probably every theory will someday experience its no. Most theories soon after conception. And I think even Einstein there is distinguishing between the theory and the scientific experiment. As he says, yeah, if an experiment agrees with a theory, there's the, there's the, there's your gold standard, the experiment, right? If it agrees with a theory, it means for the theory, maybe, but it doesn't mean for science, maybe. That's established within the experiment. How you then validate, use experiment to validate your theory is the point that I think is the bit that's object for future debate because that's an extrapolation past the experiment and what the hypothesis says is not what will be within the theory specifically. But isn't he talking about the colloquial theory? Because don't you get yes. the scientific theory after the experiment? Yes, yes. No. He's correct. That's my point. Spot on. Yes, he's talking about the... When you say colloquial, he could be talking about the mathematical theory and he's bastardizing what actually occurs. So in... In linguistic terms, he makes sense, right? Because he's saying that the theory comes after the experiment. Well, yeah, in science, you do your experiment and then comes your theory afterwards. But that's not what he's actually saying. He's saying that the 
experiment might match up with your mystic Meg, a.k.a. his mathematical theory that makes predictions also, and the science might match that. So it might back your mystic Meg theory. Well, that's not actual science. He's just twisting what actually occurs after you do an experiment. So first phenomena, then supposition of cause, then systematic experimentation to validate that cause, then theory. For him, first theory. Yeah, he's being squirrely with the words. <laughs> Guys can't do that crap anymore, man. <laughs> we just pay all... This is why they say the words, the definitions of words don't mean anything. They just want to use words however they want. Now that we pay attention, <laughs> where are they? Tumbleweeds. Words do mean things. And in this case, the theory and the way the ballers are taking it is they're all encapsulating just so story. And I would agree with them there. They're all encapsulating just so stories will change, even if they base them on real science. But when, yeah, or ignored bits of real science. And that's, that's I think, the misnomer. It's not that science doesn't prove anything. It's, it's the just so story that you build around it, which isn't scientific necessarily. That will get disproven over time, probably quickly, as Einstein states there. Right. But the, it's the science, the experiment. If an experiment agrees with a theory, it means for the theory it might still be true. Yeah. But it's the gold standard is the experiment that tells you your theory clear off, talking nonsense. You don't agree with experiment. So, of course, theories will often, if they're never fully validated scientifically, they will change. And that, that I agree with. But to try and extrapolate that into meaning that science doesn't mean anything is... I say it's contradictory to what Einstein is stating is the gold standard to destroy theories, which is experiment. Right. Just before you go, Brian, um, Flutter, sorry, did, did you want to add something? Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, just in terms of there's a nuanced point that Adam was making there about the false falsifiability of a claim so that if it's proven to concord or, or it aligns with the experiment, then temporarily for now, it's a maybe. And I've heard some Globers then say, see, science is always trying to falsify. So then it's not to prove, it's to disprove. And then they're almost focusing on the null and not really what the hypothesis is. So, you know, maybe if you guys want to address that as well. Sure. So the requirement for systematic experimentation falls on the shoulders of the validity in the hypothesis for its ability for falsification. That's where you get the null. I did explain this earlier, but I'll explain it again now. So you can't simultaneously have if A, then B, and at the same time simultaneously, if A, not B. Only one can be true. So that lining up of a hypothesis with a null gives you the empiricism and gives you the falsification ability when you do the experiment. One or other will be proven incorrect. You will falsify either the null or the alternative. So you do the experiment, and you draw a line through one of them and under the other. Make sense? So you're going to falsify one, prove yeah, it wrong, perfect. and you're going to prove the other one right. So you're going to prove A causes B, well, then you disproved that A doesn't cause B. You proved that incorrect. You have falsified your null. Yeah? If you vary A and it doesn't cause B, that's your prediction in the null. You validate your null. You have falsified your alternative. Okay? Yeah. And the skewed perception, if they, if they only focus on the negative outcome in both experiments, then they could see science as falsifying or negative but if like you said one has to be proven positive while the other is proven false and that can only be the case because it would violate the law of non-contradiction for anything other than that to occur at the end of the experimentation stage you can't have a causing b and a not causing b you can't cause it and not cause it at the same time that's not possible can I Unless it's something? Coriolis. Go on, Alwyn. 
I think Brian yeah, was going to add something as well. But go ahead, Brian. Uh, oh, go ahead, yeah, Alvin. Sorry. I was first, yeah, I want to address something about the scientific method and experimentation versus the theory, right? Because when Adam read that out, what I got out of it is like, yeah, you do the experiment, it is there, but the theory behind it may alter, right? Well, I'd like to actually address that by saying that, yeah, if you do the experiment in the physical world, you perform the experiment that is tied into the hypothesis and you get a result, then you have that data. You did something, it did something in the experiment that happened. And right, especially if it is repeatable, the setup, then that happens. And that is completely independent from any theor theory tied into that thing that happens, right? I think that is what it means because the backdrop struck the causal stru chain structure behind it may get very complicated. So there might be a theory like, oh, the ether causes it, right? Uh, being very sloppy here. And then you do an experiment and then, yeah, it kind of works out. You have some causal relation. And then you tie it all the way back. So yeah, that could only be possible because of the ether way, way, way behind this situation okay. that is the experiment. Okay, okay, okay. So what you've actually described is an affirming the consequent formal logical fallacy and then just described it with the title experiment. Can I? No, but I'm, from, I'm from trying Owen's to say you, Owen, let me, let me just address that. All right. Way. No, yes and no. So yes you could have an experiment that validates something scientifically and you could then use that proof within a theory such as oh this bit of proof fits within my theory of ether yeah that doesn't mean the theory of ether is scientific and it certainly probably means it's going to get disproven later but what will not get disproven is the solid experiment you did yeah which you then used conjecture to to get to your just so story theory but the solid experiment still stands as factually and scientifically correct. How you use that individual fact you get from the experiment to postulate a theory is on you, yeah, and isn't scientific. Our, that's but The science of the experiment and the conclusion it comes to is and will stay valid. Wow. That's actually what I wanted to say. <laughs> you said it so much better, but that is kind of like what I got out of it because I make a distinct difference between conceptual things and structures in your mind and how you connect data and the data out there because data is data, data is immutable, data doesn't change. Things that happen, happen, right? Or that happened, have happened. They can never be unhappened. And that's something that is very solidly reliable. And that's also what makes experimentation in the proper scientific theory setup so valuable because Spot it's on. resting on immutable things. Exactly. What you're describing is phenomena. So you're saying for that to have occurred, something caused it and it and the effect was observed. Therefore, I don't know if you what word Im immutable or something like that. But you're saying for it to be a phenomena, you've got to observe it being a phenomena. And for it to have happened, the cause of it must have caused it. In other words, that's the solid foundation that you can actually start basing things on. As opposed to you understanding the abstract, which you do. But that's very different to the things actually occurring in front of you in real life. Right, Arwin? Right. It's the difference between empirical and conceptual. Can I add something to that? <clears throat> the position we're in, well, not that we're not in it, but the position that the world is in at the moment with gravity is they're looking for a way to throw Albert Einstein out, uh, out the window uh, because they're looking for the graviton. It's a massless, right? Mass, mass is a inertia. Inertia is a, is a description. So it's a descriptionless particle that has... Um, that moves around from place to place instant instantaneously, and it can't be measured and it can't be detected. So how we're going to find this, I don't know. Do I have to make it up? Um, well, uh, hang on, hang on. Don't, 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 right? They are going to find it in a black hole, right? Out, light years away, out in um, an entropy, entropy violation. 
But the reason they ended up with Einstein in the first place, right, is because they knew that what they were working off of, which was mass attracting mass, wasn't real. So they needed something. They were desperate, and Einstein seemed to notice. And what did Einstein do? Einstein gave them a cause and never defined the effect. He just changed the word, used the word gravity, made it into something completely different from what it was before, didn't define what it was, called it an effect, didn't define what this effect would be. Like saying the curvature of space-time is not defining the effect because in the real world you won't see this effect that he that he claimed. You won't see the apparent, that the gravity is an apparent effect of acceleration or apparent orbits. Like these are some of the things that were thrown out there as the effect that we would observe. But we don't observe any effect. So what happened is that he gave the world a cause before there was ever an effect. And then you have things like the Affeli Keating and the Pound Repka investigations, or you could call them findings, who people who went off and they did their best to find some effect to attribute to general relativity and say it's validated. The whole point is that you find the effect, then you validate the cause, and then it, it's, it's validated. Not to come up with a cause and then people years later run around the place looking for some effect to validate the cause. It's completely backwards. They're working backwards. I was just going to say yeah. that. Yeah, that's exactly it. He started at step one. What's step one? Well, Alwyn described it beautifully earlier. You take something tangible that's occurring, that's your phenomena, and you ask yourself the question that they say you should ask when you ask a question. And of course they don't, they just say ask a question. But the question is, what caused that? I wonder why that happened. Something along those lines? Well, what happened was the thing that you're actually going to observe first, as opposed to Brian, who succinctly described having a cause before you've got an effect. Yeah. Well, and there's another thing to this. So the... We lost you, John. Go, John, go. Go. We're all with you. Oh, sorry. I accidentally hit the mute button twice. Uh, when you observe a phenomenon, right... You're, you're going to be measuring it in some way, whether it's, you know, optically, uh, with a ruler. There, there's going to be a way to measure it. If you don't have an accurate description of uh, that convention, you're never going to be able to enter the scientific method. And that's, that's the problem they find themselves with R. They're never going to be able to enter the scientific method because they got a, an incorrect convention to describe the phenomenon. That's, that's, if you see on screen, that's my next point, John. They're, they're not doing science. Um, I've, I've highlighted the first bit there. You've heard our greatest scientific theories. It explains what they think science is. It's a theory. It's not the, the composite experiments that make it. Um, but if you go to the bottom, I'll just highlight it. Yeah. Uh, except that's a complete lie. While they provide very strong evidence for those theories, they aren't proof, in fact, when it comes to science, proving anything is an impossibility. Now, if you look at the things they're talking about, they're talking about fossils, they're talking about DNA, they're talking about Hubble expansion of the universe. In all of those things, and I'll refer you to housekeeping, show me where they demonstrate science once in any of these disciplines. Give me one theory from astronomy yeah that's the point it from the very beginning the way they're talking and to be honest the, the way they, they're critiquing what they do is probably correct it doesn't prove anything because never from the beginning was any of their so-called experiments a scientific experiment that's right what, what, I, what i was going to say about the ball as a while ago I'm um, just calling them ballers, uh, just as easier than saying anti flat out as, as a short, short phrase. Um, is that they remind me of people who go to boxing matches. You know, these people that turn up at these big boxing matches and they're all drinking and whatever else. You know, you see them on TV and that. And they're shouting in at the ring at people who are professional boxers who probably train six days a week, several times a day, go through all kinds of hell. And they turn up there, and the people are some drunk guy is back twenty rows back, shouting at some guy to get up. 
or whatever. Or just hit him. him. Just hit him. Yeah. That drives me yeah. crazy, Brian. Yeah. And it's like, you know that these people have never even sparred one round with an amateur boxer. Never mind, you know, with their friends. And it's like, you just know that these people are have no idea of the, of the reality of the situation. The ballers remind me of them, as opposed yeah. to the other fans who ha, who do know that reality, who did experience it, or do so, know something about it, and they're not shouting in the ring for the boxer to do this, that, or the other thing, because they know what is possible and not possible. You know, they know that, bother, that boxer just got a body shot, they know he's winded, they know there's only so much you can do in that position, especially when they're a professional boxer trying to kill you, or whatever. But the people shouting, the ballers are the fellas in the background, shouting and screaming at someone to get up or do whatever, you know, just hit him, you know, all this kind of stuff. Without hand Meanwhile, he can't even keep his arms up. They're so tired yeah, from wearing yeah. gloves, jumping up and down. I told my son one day, do you realize that he can't hit him right now? He's freaking exhausted. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Like, they, they don't know the reality. Yeah, you freeze so up. You freeze yeah, up from the from the pain and shit, and then you can literally not move for a while. Well, there's only so much you can keep our hands off. But, okay, okay. Enough of the boxing analogies. Oh, boxing. hold on, hold on. Right, yeah. We're going to go around in circles on boxing analogies forever. <laughs> you were talking about the chat skanks and peanut gallery, Brian. Do you want to bring it back onto that? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to be boxing. It can be football. It can be whatever. It's like they are not... They don't know right, what right. real science is, so science is anything to them. If you understand what I mean, it can be anything. Anything is possible. You know, uh, the curving of space time, all this kind of stuff. Anything is possible. Gas pressure without containment. All these things are possible when you don't know the reality of the situation. The reality is gas pressure without a container is not possible. And neither is space time possible because space time requires gas pressure without a container. We require a vacuum without a container and gas not going off into it. Anyway, the point is, is that these people shout and scream about stuff that is complete craziness simply because they don't know the reality. They're not living in reality. They don't, they've never actually been interested in science. They've only ever had an interest in pseudoscience. But they'll never actually ever be in a position where real, where, where a real science experiment has to be done. They'll never be in the position. They won't even accept the scientific method. Perfect. With that, I'm going to say a huge, massive, enormous thank you to both Discord and G Plus panels for making today's after show possible. Of course, a massive thank you to all of you in either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley primary streams for hopefully smashing the super chat, liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, hitting the PayPal link, joining as a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member, and all that good stuff. I've been Nathan Oakley, and I will see you all in the next video.